Hello, today we're doing section one of the IGCSE bio course, which is all about the nature and variety of living organisms. So it's split up into two sections between A, the characteristics of living organisms, and B, the variety of living organisms. Today we're going to do the characteristics because it's really simple and there's only one syllabus statement. Know that all living organisms share the following characteristics. So what does this mean? It basically means you need to know Mrs. Gren, H. Let's go over that. M, they move. R, they respire. S, they are sensitive to their surroundings. G, they grow and develop. R, they reproduce. E, they excrete. N, they need nutrition. And finally, H, which stands for homeostasis. Homeo is the Greek word for similar, and stasis is the Greek word for stable. So, similar stable. What does that mean? It basically means that they maintain a similar internal environment of relatively stable conditions. Okay, so the second section is on the variety of living organisms. Basically, you need to be able to describe the different characteristics shared by organisms. Animals, they are multicellular. They consist of more than one cell. How do you know this? Well, because your dog is not microscopic and therefore he consists of more than one cell. Animals also have this thing called nervous coordination, which means they can respond quickly to the challenges brought by their environment. Another thing is living organisms need some way of storing their energy, and in humans or in animals we get this from our carbohydrates and other places, but carbohydrates is the main one. Okay, and we need to be able to store these carbohydrates in the form of glycogen. Because we are not plants, we do not need to photosynthesize and therefore we do not need chloroplasts. We also do not need cell walls. Plants are also multicellular, however, unlike us animals, they do need to photosynthesize to get their energy, which means they do need to contain chloroplasts. Chloroplasts are the little organelles within them which contain chlorophyll, which allows them to convert their carbon dioxide and their H2O, or water, into oxygen and glucose. Plants also need cell walls because they need to be able to retain their structure, and they also like to store their energy in the form of starch or sucrose. Now fungi are slightly weird because some of them are multicellular and other ones are unicellular. And the multicellular ones are slightly more interesting because they have all these fun words like mycelium and hyphae. Basically they have a body which is called a mycelium, which is made up of tons of little hyphae, which contain tons of nuclei. Now fungi do not photosynthesize, so how do they get their energy? Well, good question. Saprotrophic nutrition. That's kind of a big word, so let's break it down yet again. Sapros, Greek word for rotten. Trophe, Greek word for nourishment. Rotten nourishment. What does that mean? Well, they get their nourishment from rotten, aka non-living things. In the case of fungi, they secrete extracellular enzymes into the area outside their body to dissolve their food, which allows them to absorb the nutrients. Fungi cell walls are made of this stuff called chitin, and like us humans, they store their carbohydrates in the form of glycogen. Some examples of fungi, yeast, which is unicellular, and mucor, which is multicellular. Now bacteria are microscopic and single-celled, and they do not contain a nucleus. Some of them can photosynthesize, while others have to feed off of either living or dead organisms. But what they do contain is a circular chromosome of DNA. Chromosome. Circular chromosome of DNA which is basically this thing here. Another thing they contain is plasmids, which are little extra bits of DNA. They also contain a cell wall, a cell membrane, and cytoplasm. Examples of bacteria, Lactobacillus bulgaris, which is the thing that makes your milk go sour, and pneumococcus, which is the thing that causes pneumonia. Protoctus are microscopic and single-celled. Some contain chloroplasts while others do not. Two examples are amoeba, which have a structure kind of like an animal cell, and chlorella, which has a structure kind of like a plant cell. 
the final organism you need to know about are viruses. They are not actually cells, they are particles. Um, they are smaller than bacteria and they do not have cellular structure. Instead, they have this thing called a protein coat surrounding a piece of DNA or RNA. They also come in a wide variety of shapes and sizes and sometimes they are considered non-living. This is because they require a host to survive. They cannot reproduce unless they are inside another living organism. Examples of viruses. Tobacco mosaic virus. It stops chloroplasts from growing and it therefore causes the leaves to turn brown. Um, there's the influenza virus, which makes you sick, common cold, flu, whatever. Um, and the third one is HIV, which causes AIDS. That's a pathogen. Final syllabus statement for this section is all about pathogens. You need to recall the term pathogen and know that pathogens can be protoctists or bacteria or viruses or whatever. So, some examples we already heard of. HIV, virus which causes AIDS. Influenza, also a virus which causes the flu. Plasmodium, a protoctist which causes malaria. And pneumococcus, a bacteria which causes pneumonia. And that's literally it for section one. You just need to know about pathogens, living organisms, and Mrs. Gren.